Welcome back to the final session of the Bundesbank Autumn Conference on Banking and Payments in the Digital World. I hope you enjoyed the panel discussion earlier this morning as well as the two academic sessions. We're now ready to move on to the final part of our virtual conference, the keynote by Markus Brunemeyer. Markus does not need an introduction, but let me just say a few personal words. Markus is the Edward Sanford Professor of Economics at Princeton University. He also directs the Bentheim Center of Finance there. Markus has made numerous highly cited academic contributions in different fields of economics and finance. But he's also very much engaged and heard in the political debate, especially on topics of relevance for Europe, be it on European safe bonds or other reform proposals for the euro area. Somehow magically, Marcus has a feel for new important topics and for putting easy to remember labels on his ideas. COVAR, the conditional value at risk, and the reversal interest rate, the rate at which accommodative monetary policy becomes contractionary for lending are just two examples. Despite his tremendous influence on the academic and policy debate and the high opportunity costs that go with it, Marcus is generous with his time. As one example of this, he has supported our work here at the Bundesbank as a member of the Research Council for many years now. And he has taken over the helm of the Council from Richard Clarida last year. As with other topics that were later identified as important, Marcus has left his mark early in the now burgeoning literature on digital money and blockchain economics. And we're now eager to hear his thoughts as the last highlight of the day. Marcus, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Emmanuel, for this nice intro introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you today at the Bundesbank Conference on Banking and Payments in the Digital World. I will talk about money in the digital age, which is based on joint work with, I've done with several co-authors earlier across several papers. So when you think about digital money, you might ask yourself, don't we have digital money already in form of checking accounts and we make transfers from one digital account to another digital account. That's indeed the case, but that's inside money. It's the liability of the bank. But there are also some new forms of money which, is, which are outside money, currencies, which are not the liability of anybody else. Then you have also, of course, M-Pesa, you have Alipay, WeChat Pay, you have the Libra developments. There are a lot of new things developing. And here I've just depicted a beggar in China who is actually not asking for coins anymore. He has a two QR codes around his neck, collecting either Alipay transfers or WeChat pay transfers. And the questions which arise here are very fundamental ones. So will private digital money drive out cash from the central banks? Or will central banks lose their grip even on monetary policy, which would be very worrisome? So will platforms steal the senior-rich benefits governments and private banks enjoy? And you know, will there be digital dollarization? Will there be digital do currency areas? Will CBDC, central bank digital currency, be the answer to go against these trends and offer some alternative offered by the central banks? Or should big tech companies be forced to become narrow banks and the platforms be forced to be interoperable across platforms, not containers where you cannot move outside a particular container? Now, I would like to structure my talk in the following way. I will first start with some technological trends. Then I talk about new forms of currency competition. How does the technology change the currency competition? And then I would like to talk about monetary sovereignty and then ultimately talk about the international monetary system and digital currency areas. So let me start with the technological trends. Of course, one big trend was the smartphone. The smartphone made digital payments in the supermarket and whenever you buy something in the store much more easier. So you can just with a smartphone make a payment, use an Alipay account or Apple Pay, whatever you want to use, you can make easy transfers. But the equally important are the digital platforms. Digital platforms offer a lot of transactions on in the digital space. We have essentially a digital lifestyle. We have a life on digital platforms. And with the COVID crisis became even more pronounced and more important that we do a lot of our activities on uh, digital platforms, including this virtual conference. And the key to these digital platforms is that the platforms will collect a ton of data, a lot of big data, 
and the new innovation, new technological trends is that we can make use of this data. We can make use through deep learning, machine learning algorithms, through artificial intelligence, and this gives us a rich set of, of uh, recommender systems. So we can analyze this data, and then the provider of this currency, of this platform, has a, a recommender system, which is then attractive again to uh, the customers. The next trend is that we will have smart contracts on global value chain or any value chain with their suppliers, uh, supply chains going on. And actually the smart contracts, when a good is reaching a certain destination, immediately the payment is executed automatically. So there will be contingent payments to minimize credit risk. There is no credit risk involved because the payment happens exactly when the good is delivered at a certain location under certain circumstances. There will be through the Internet of Things, there will be a, a lot of payments from machine to machine rather than triggered by a person. That also has to happen in the digital space. And finally, there are tokens, like cash is a token. There's a finality of payment as I pass on my coin to you, the payment happened automatically. No third party has to verify that. And the distributed ledger technologies, DLTs and other cryptocurrencies, they're essentially building on a token system. And finally, we have micropayments. Now you can make payments of a few cents or even half a cent uh, if it's, it's needed. So you can do it at very, very low cost, which you couldn't do early on. And all of these new trends, they impact to society as a whole, but they also impact how money is seen and some concepts, theoretical concepts of money are coming back. So let me go to these technological trends and first focus on one technological trend, which is the inversion of power, which is called inverse selection. So far, we have a world where there's a lot of adverse selection. The informational advantage is with the customer, the borrower, the insurance client. But soon, the informational advantage will switch away from the customer towards uh, the lender, or the insurance company or the asset managers. They will know more about me than I know about myself. That has huge implications for privacy regulation. And the key is that, you know, the platform will not know all the trades I have, but it will have a very good picture about the connection between my trades and the, the features which are relevant for the product they are selling. So to give you an example, I might like red cars and I might know that I like red cars, but insurance companies know from big data that people who buy red cars, they are more accident prone. So they have, they're more likely to have an accident. And there's a lot of this information which links institutional, uh, which links individual data to some behavior which I might not know uh, in myself. And that's essentially many, many types of this data. So if you are, for example, I might have some privacy protection against uh, being some x-rays of mine being revealed, but what the artificial intelligence allows us to link particular x-rays to some illnesses, which are very, very informative uh, for many of these companies. Okay, so that goes a little bit beyond uh, the payment system, but the payments is the same thing. If I buy certain products with certain colors, it might link, uh, might allow the artificial intelligence to infer something about my default probabilities, even though you might not think there's exactly any connection between the two. But in general, the information advantage I have as a customer, and hence I get some consumer surplus, is going away towards these platforms with this great um, artificial intelligence power. And that's what we call, instead of adverse selection problems, a la Rothschild, Stiglitz, and so forth, is going away towards inverse selection, where these big companies infer from the few observations they make about myself and the combination of all the other data from millions of other customers across a broad spectrum uh, to infer a lot. Um, and they have a better picture about my risks and dangers and other things than I have on my own. The other big tech trend is that we have this huge big data machine learning deep learning uh, revolution going on. 
and that changes the economies of scope and scale. So essentially, we have a, a, a lot of data, more data from each individual person. You have unstructured data, you have textual data, you might have some voice data, you have social media data and payment data, and a lot of diversity of data. And that speaks again to capture the whole scope of a person, all these different interactions of the person, the friends, and so forth. That speaks for platforms, and that will transform how finance will be done. Because and payment data is at the key, is one key input for this as well. On top of the scope dimension, you also have the scale dimension. Uh, there might be some diminishing returns to scale. We don't know, or it might be not the case. But in general, there's a size effect. The winner takes it all. If you're bigger, you get more data. Then you have a better recommender system. Because you have a better recommender system, as you can see over here, uh, they have a better recommender system. You might also have more customers again because customers uh, uh, flock to you, and then the size will be. And that's some self-reinforcing winner-takes-it-all mechanism at place. Okay, and that that's actually what to keep in mind that you know this big you know, big data technological innovation leads to a drift towards platforms, and it leads to an inversion of adverse selection or of informational advantages away from adverse selection towards uh, what we call inverse selection. So this leads to these platforms where traditionally we had banks controlling the data. So we had the customer B and we had the customer A. So the customer B wants to save with the bank and then the bank lends to customer A, let's say. So the lending deposit taking was put together in a banking system, in a bank, and the bank was controlling this data. But the bank had no uh, data on others, on other behavior, what you did you know, on your texture analysis for your Twitter account or whatever social media activity, how your voice will react and all this. And if you have platforms, platforms collect not only your payment data, becomes payment becomes at the center because it's very valuable information. There's the whole email commerce activities you do, your whole your social networks and so forth. The platform combines all the data and banking is outside of the entity which controls most of the data has the most available information. That will change, uh, lead to a change in the industrial organization of financial activities, away from a bank-centric environment to a payment-centric environment. And then it will be the case that the platform, like Alibaba or WeChat, will say, okay, I have a customer here who would like to borrow X uh, number of euros, and then it goes to a bunch of banks and says, oh, you banks, you can compete. Who is providing the loan to this customer A? And then you can see already where the information rent or the power to generate some profits is with the platform rather than with, with the bank uh, as it was traditionally. Okay, there's a shift away from the bank-centric world to a payment or platform-centric world. And that's a radical change in attitudes and also in the financial I.O. structure, industrial organization structure we're seeing coming up. So these technological trends are there and they are coming. And in certain countries, like in China, we have already a platform environment. And of course, traditional banks are trying to fight it back, but we essentially two big players are already established. So the question now is, once we see these trends and see where the whole train is going, uh, what is the implications for currencies and what's the implications for currency competitions? Can these platforms even offer their own currency? And later we'll say, what does it mean to have your own currency? So in order to go to currency competition, uh, we go back to Hayek 1976, where Hayek in the height of the high inflation was actually saying, oh, it's actually good to have competition among currencies because that keeps individuals' currencies more in check. There's some control over that. But typically we know from the I.O. literature that you can reduce competition if you bundle products together. And money is actually a bundle of several services. What are the three roles of money which are bundled together in one form of money? It's a unit of account. So whether you measure things in, in dollars or in euros or in yens or remimbis, it's the same thing a unit of account, how you measure distance in meters or miles or temperature in Celsius or 
in, uh, in Fahrenheit. Uh, then the store of value and the medium of exchange. And there's always, you know, these three offers are together. There might be some currency which is a better currency as a medium of exchange and another currency which is a better currency in terms of store of value. So, for example, if I live in Frankfurt, uh, then it's actually having euros is a very good medium of exchange and the dollar is probably not such a good medium of exchange. But there might be another currency which might be a better store of value and, and then I you know, I go for the euro nevertheless because it's a much better medium for exchange. And we had this traditionally as well. You know, we had silver for small transactions, which was much lower medium of exchange, and gold for a larger transaction and also more for a store of value. If you were to store something, you use gold. If you want to buy things, especially smaller things, you go for silver. And currencies were always competing in bundles. So whether you have a dollar or the euro as a currency, you compete in a bundle, all three services combined. Technology allows us to unbundle that. So that's a big first thing. You can have, why is that? Because the switching cost from one currency to the next will be very, very small. The bit ask is are tiny and you can switch it on the iPhone or on the smartphone very easily. And that's essentially so this huge unbundling. You can say I have a certain currency which is very good as a store of value, gives me a higher real interest rate, but it's not so good as a medium of exchange. So I hold this currency as a store of value and just a millisecond before I want to purchase something, I transfer it to the medium of exchange, the, the currency which is a better medium for exchange. Okay, and that's essentially declining switching costs, unbundle the three roles of money. And it also means the declining role of network externalities. Okay, So you can actually switch to you, you're less locked in in a particular currency, even if it's you know high inflation currency, you're not locked in because you can actually switch easily back and forth. And that's where the competition will be more fierce. So technology will make the competition across traditional currencies more fierce. And there's a less coordination required, you know, that we all have the same currency because we can switch very easily. And that declining switching cost leads to declining network externalities. It's a little bit like, you know, unit of account is how we speak, you know, coordinating on certain sounds to be a particular language. That's, you know, the speech translation software, it will be the same declining switching technology. And then there will be less lock-in effects from uh, the existing a unit of account of the existing language. Now, this is the first thing in terms of currency competition. Unbundling makes currency competition more fierce. But then there will be a rebundling with certain platforms and ecosystems. Okay, So currencies will actually connect to some ecosystem. And the ecosystem, these platforms, especially private ones, have a tendency to become locked in systems. And smart contracts, recommender systems will be within this system. And there will be different currencies specializing in different attributes. So there might be money product differentiation. So each money will offer a different service. There will be some currency which is a very good currency to keep everything private, but it gives you a lower interest rate, real interest rate. Another currency say, okay, we don't protect your privacy. We sell all the data from your payments but we give you a higher interest rate and there might be different customers preferring one or the other. And there is a, they are essentially cater to different parts of society. But more generally, what's very important, private currencies and private platforms combined with their currencies and tokens, essentially tokens on platforms, they will try to make closed ecosystems and will not make it so easy to switch from one to the next. So more generally, what's really important is to understand platforms because they will offer their own tokens which are forms of currencies and they have greater control over this digital currency than the central bank has over its currencies uh, and that's essentially rather than taking what we do in monetary economics often the environment is given so this will be environmental frictions typically for this platform these are strategic choices okay so that's an io perspective on money the platform can make strategic choices. So what are the strategic choices? The platform can decide, you know, what, how much does it cost to enter a certain 
a platform with its token or by these tokens on this platform. Uh, it can also decide how useful will be these tokens. You can subsidize or have some using co user cost uh, by saying, okay, I subsidize certain amount of trading if you use my own tokens, or I give you certain privacy on this. And then there will be an exit cost that comes back what Hewn was referring to this wall. But here I have a Berlin wall. It's not a, a wall where you can't come in. It's a wall where you don't let you out. That's like the exit cost. So that's why I call it the Berlin wall because they, don't, they didn't let you out, essentially. And it was not to protect the others from coming in, but from their own people not being able to get out. And what to have essentially, and then once I've locked you in, I can inflate your token value away. So that's essentially what I've with this little picture. Here I have some fish coming in, and the fish are then inside here, they are locked inside, and it's hard to get out. So the, the sentence uh, would like you to take away lure you in, they try to lure you in, then they lock you in, and then they inflate the value of the tokens away. Okay, and that's the tension uh, you might have, and the platform might go that way. And you see it, you know, if you have airline miles, which, which is also very limited as a platform, you can think of airline miles as a very reduced, very limited platform, what you can do that, but you might get them very easily, the entry costs are low, you, have, you can use them, uh, but you know, you cannot use them for anything else, and occasionally they inflate the value of the airline miles away, and not occasionally, they are regularly do. And that's just one way to see how this will work at the much broader sense, also for tokens on various platforms. But there will be competition across the platforms. And of course, there's competition between a private platform and public money. And this competition is there because the public money, if it's in cash, it doesn't have this digital convenience. Of course, um, Public money is also less competitive. It can't impose some exit cost or entry cost. It has much fewer parameters to play with. And it also has to, in terms of growth rate of money supply or token supply, is actually based on macroeconomic shocks. It cannot fine tune to certain, uh, cater to certain members of a platform. Okay, so there will be more competition on this. And that's, you know, what will come to the digital dollarization. To what extent will essentially public money be at a disadvantage and these digital tokens take over a large chunk of our payment system. Now, on top of it, of course, there's competition between two, three, and all the private platforms and private currencies. Okay, And then the question is, what will be the regulation to make it, is it really the case that everybody can just give tokens and lock you in? Or is it important that there's some interoperability uh, like in the European Payment Initiative and all this, where you many, many banks coming together and have some interoperability uh, ensured. So there's interoperability and convertibility are the most important part of it. Another form of regulation is, of course, do you want to treat the tokens as narrow banks? So if they give out some tokens, some stable coins, they have to back it with 100% of central bank reserves in order to make them some euro tokens on this particular platform. So this competition between currencies with the official money is there. The platforms have an advantage. First, they have more digital convenience and they have more parameters to play with compared to the official currency. And then there's competition across uh, the various currencies, across various platforms, and whether you enforce some interoperability and swapping, getting out of, from one to the next. and of course, there will be behavioral biases playing a big role as well. People might not notice that actually getting into this trap, uh, you're subsidized, and then you can't get out, and then it will be inflated away. So all of these things regulators have to keep in, in mind. So this digital dollarization, the currency competition, is the same as digital dollar, dollarization, or currency competition with public money of local authority and some new digital currency that's referred to as digitalization uh, in the same spirit as the dollar might drive out the local currency in some particular country. And the key of the three roles of the money, the key role is the unit of account. So it's, you know, if you lose the unit of account, you lose essentially your dollarized in a digital fashion. 
And how do you do it? You can do it through offering another currency, which is a better medium of exchange, or you can move for another currency, which is a better store of value. And typically, the way it works is the better medium of exchange. So when, for example, the dollar was replacing the British pound as the international currency, dominant currency, it worked first for the medium of exchange role, because you offer a better payment system, a better elegant way to pay with it. And it could be that the remember is offering, you know, for many countries in Asia, a very convenient way of making payments. And the important thing is, and that goes back to what Madame Lagarde mentioned uh, in her dinner speech uh, last night, is Rudy Dornbusch is right in this saying that, you know, first everything takes much longer than you think, but when it happens, it, at the end it happens very fast. So this happens very sudden and there's a highly non-linear effect. So we know from dollarization from earlier work with Chang and Velasco uh, that this happens, you know, first you think it happens very slow, the dollar or this new digital currency is not taking off the currency and suddenly happens very fast and then your local currency is gone. And that's what refers to digital dollarization. So which countries are most vulnerable to a digital dollarization? So traditionally, countries which are small, are very open, have a large informal sector where anyway any transactions are done at the informal sector primarily, they are very vulnerable to a traditional dollarization. But what's about digital dollarization? So first of all, if you have an inefficient electronic payment system, on your own, in your own currency, then it's likely that you will be um, replaced with some new digital currency or your currency, the official currency will be replaced. And also, if you have not a big social media presence, so if your IT sector is not very developed um, and it's mostly coming from uh, international IT services, then it's also much more likely that you will be replaced, your currency will be replaced by some new digital private currency. So what are your defense lines? The defense lines are, you can say, okay, I have as an official currency, I have the lender of last resort possibility. I have some taxing power. I have some good uh, fiscal space. I have some good governance structure, good institutions, which the private entity might not have. And this gives me some credibility for my currency. In particular, I don't want to have a checking account in some private currency denominated because I don't know whether there will be a lender of last resort. So people might be reluctant to switch to this other currency. Of course, if a big international corporation says, we will put our balance sheet behind supporting our currency, that might be a different story. The other defense line might be CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. You say, okay, I know that my public cash is a poor substitute for private digital money, but I'm offering also digital money as a central bank in the official currency, and then there's no need to switch to a private uh, uh, digital currency. Okay, And that's one way to go. That's like the retail CBDC Jens Weidmann was talking earlier about. Uh, uh, but here you can have either retail CBDC, where the central bank is really offering some digital currency directly to citizens in the country, or it could be offered through uh, stable coins where you know a private entity is offering some digital currency but they have to back it to 100 percent with the central bank and that's like wholesale uh, cbdc it's like a narrow bank arrangement uh, the bank has to hold for each stable coin it issues it has to hold some reserve unit some official wholesale cbdc with the central bank so having like a narrow bank arrangement and as I mentioned before, another defense line is, of course, you have to regulate the private platforms. You enforce convertibility. So that's like making it a stable coin, essentially, with 100% backing and interoperability. But in general, what you want, I guess, is you let the private platforms explore and invent. You don't want to hinder innovation um, and then or typically what happens later, if you think there's a public interest, you appropriate, but you give the private sector essentially some uh, certain period of monopoly rents where they can exploit it and innovate, inno invent and innovate. And then later on, they might, you might as a government expropriate again. So this is about new currency competition. We had this unbundling and then this rebundling and this 
then this digital dollarization, how it will phase out dynamically. It will become very slow and then suddenly it will happen very fast, as we know from regular dollarization. What's about monetary sovereignty? Can you relate it to that? What is monetary sovereignty and how can you maintain it? Or is it of any interest to maintain it? So first, monetary sovereignty, and that's probably the most important slide here, is there, you can think of four components at least. One is the seniorage. You might say there are some rents from money creation. You can print new money, you create seniorage, and that's a store of value. That's the store of value role of money, which is emphasized. So you can actually issue some debt in form of money, which pays a very low interest rate. And financial repression in a broader sense is also a seniorage, so you can broaden the definition of seniorage. And if you have this ability, you don't want to give it away. So part of it goes to private banks, and we will highlight this later, and part of it goes to the government, and probably it depends on the competitiveness within the banking sector. Now the second thing is, besides seniorage, you might say that's an important element, but I think the more important thing is whether you control monetary policy to manage the macroeconomy, to manage business or even financial cycles, that it can actually lean against it and stimulate the economy if there's a recession and slow down the economy if there's excessive buildup of risk. And the question is, do you want to leave this task to private firms like Facebook to manage the macroeconomy? And in order to control monetary policy, it's not the store of value role which matters the most, it's a unit of account. So to preserve the unit of account. And what does it mean to preserve the unit of account? There are two ways to view this. One is the intratemporal aspect. So within the period, for that, you know how you measure it. It's a coordinating way to measure it, and that's mostly a behavioral thing. So it's, of course, you understand prices in euros better because you're familiar in euros. You pay every day in euros. You go to next door. You know what the milk costs in the previous store. And if suddenly it's translated into dollars and the exchange rate moves all the time, it's, you don't have the same sense and feelings uh, you have with your own compared to your own currency. It's the same with, as I mentioned earlier, with temperature Celsius or Fahrenheit. That's a more behavioral story. But what's even probably equally important, even more important, is the intertemporal aspect, where monetary policy is really redistributing wealth and is risk shift has risk shifting effects okay and for that you know you have to understand uh, you know what's the underlying friction so if you have followed the new keynesian school the main friction is some stickiness in prices there's some invoicing and people then the firms cannot change the price because there's some switching costs or menu costs or whatever other reasons you might have if you come more from the financial friction side, and both can be true, the financial friction side is more, how is the debt denominated? If the debt is denominated, you have a 10-year bond or five-year mortgage, and if then the interest rate moves, then it, you change the value of the interest rate. But if the interest rate is determined in nominal terms, and if the repayment is determined in nominal terms, then you change the real value of this debt claim or this mortgage and so forth. And you redistribute big time wealth. Unless you can redistribute wealth and you can also transfer risk. So for example, if you face a huge shock down the road, for example, will the Brexit be soft or hard, which we don't know, you might say, uh, you communicate, you know, if it's a hard Brexit, it will be costly for us, but we will share this cost, the losses, across society by let inflation go a little bit higher. If it's a soft Brexit, we'll let inflation go not so high. And this way you can ex ante, you have some risk sharing arrangement with nominal claim holders, many, many, not all in society, for all, including everybody, not everybody who can just trade some derivative on the hard or soft Brexit derivative, okay? Because most people don't do that. And that's essentially done through the appropriate monetary policy uh, by the central bank. And this power to really redistribute wealth and risk appropriately, as described in the I theory of money, for example, uh, that's really what monetary sovereignty is about. And that's, I think, the key to preserve in order to conduct monetary policy, which is in the interest of the whole society and not in the interest of the profit of a particular firm. 
And then, of course, there's an, another two dimensions, is the power to bail out, to provide liquidity as a lender of last resort. So because you have the taxing power as a government, and your fiscal space, and if you have good institutions, if you have good governance, you can do that. You actually have this power to decide, okay, we can actually, if there's a crisis, we can step in and overcome some liquidity, temporary liquidity shortages. And next part of monetary sovereignty is the power to exclude from the monetary system. So you can actually exclude certain parts of society not to be a part of a platform and firms, private firms, uh, might exploit this potentially, saying we don't exclude it or might find it too costly to include all parts of society. And you can also use it geopolitically, to, uh, like uh, weaponizing the US dollar and, and other currencies. And that's an, also part of monetary sovereignty. That's a big part as well. And the question then is should this go to private firms or not? Okay. And I think the answers are probably very obvious, especially for the central bank community uh, in this room. Now, what's the arrangement between public and private money? Okay, so currently we have a two-tier arrangement. So we have uh, the government, which is issuing outside money, is determining the unit of account, is involved in some settlement, and then the private banks, they issue inside money in form of bank deposits and other things. So of course, we know the inside money is way larger than the outside money, but the anchor, which the unit of account anchor is given by the government. So the interest rate is set by the central bank. By government, I mean central bank and government together. So that's a big difference here. And so in the future, so right now we have the government and the banks. In the future, we will have the government is, of course, very much involved, including the central bank. We will have the banks, and then we have the big tech companies. And the question in the platforms, uh, with, represented here by big tech. And the question is, how will this interaction play out and the lobbying efforts by some group towards the government to have more influence? And some examples are this India stack problem where some, you know, the underlying rail system is essentially are governed by the government and impose some interoperability and other things, but then the interface with the customer is done by the private sector. Okay, and that's one way to do it. Or what the People's Bank of China did, they imposed an Arab bank model on Alipay and WeChat Pay, that all of the money which is then parked in the WeChat Pay account or Alipay account has to be backed 100% like an Arab bank with reserves from the People's Bank of China. Okay, and these are some arrangements. One has to think carefully about it, which way to go. Now, let me uh, go in, in the sense of, I think I've talked a lot about monetary sovereignty with respect to managing the macroeconomy. I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the senior, uh, senior rich income from money creation and uh, become a little bit more formal in this uh, part, just uh, to show you where senior rich is coming. So who is getting the senior rich right now before we have this digital revolution, before we introduce CBDC? And the, right now the senior rich is actually going to the, the government, central bank via central bank, and the private banking sector. We want to understand where the senior rich coming from and in a very generalized way. So here's a very general setting based on my work with Dirk Nippelt. So think of agents in the economy, they have some utility and they're subject to a budget constraint, but they're also subject to a liquidity constraint with a Lagrange multiplier lambda, okay? And this liquidity constraint could be a cash in advance constraint, you know, transactions have to be financed in advance via cash, or money and utility function. So how does money and utility function? You have a constraint which depends on the consumption bundle and then you plug it in, this consumption bundle in here, then it actually enters the utility function, just plugging in the constraint in the utility function. So it also captures this, it captures the shopping time models, captures the new monetarism models and all this. So all, most of the models we are knowing, we are knowing the literature, they are part of this, um, this particular model. So once we do this, if we take this liquidity constraint into account, our asset pricing formula takes on this form. That's the Euler equation. So the price of asset J, and the money is just one part, uh, one particular asset, 
is just the expected stochastic discount factor from t to t plus 1 times some new term here and times the payoff in period t plus 1, z is the payoff, the dividend payment or interest payment, plus the price, the new price after this period. Okay, and That's a standard uh, SDF asset pricing equation we are all familiar with. The only new term is this term, and if the, if the liquidity constraint is not there or is not binding the Lagrange multiplier is zero, then this is just one. So you multiply everything just by one. Okay. Now, if this liquidity constraint is binding, the Lagrange multiplier is, is larger than zero, there, and then has, if you hold the asset J, if the asset J, to what extent it is actually you know, affecting liquidity constraints, uh, script L, then this becomes a number you subtract from one. So the whole factor here becomes larger than one. And this whole factor I call capital lambda. Capital lambda t to t plus one, I call this larger. It will be larger than one if the liquidity constraint is binding um, effectively. And it could be uh, that you have certain assets where they don't relax the liquidity constraint at all, hence this they don't relax it. So this asset J, which doesn't relax the liquidity constraint, this will be zero. Again, this whole thing is one, uh, but it at least pays some dividends and has tomorrow some price. There will be another asset which pays almost no dividends, like cash, like no Z's, but it relaxes a lot uh, the liquidity constraints or this slope here, this derivative is very high. And if the liquidity constraint is binding, then even though the, the payoffs are low, it's still, you know, it has the factor here is overall much larger than one. So that will be leading to a high price. Okay. So what you can solve this uh, iteratively, so you solve it iteratively, so you get uh, the backwards equation, so you have essentially the price of an asset J is just the expected future stochastic discount factors, and here it's a multi-period uh, stochastic discount factor from T to T plus S, and this lambda is also multi-period, so multiplying the capital lambdas after each other gives you this capital lambdas times um, the payoffs, and then there's a bubble term. And essentially what you have is you have an asset for any asset that is for any asset J, this equation is correct. You have a fundamental term, which is the term without setting capital lambda is equal to one. Then there's a liquidity term, which is the term which is because the capital lambda is larger than one. So the part which is above uh, one, that's what they call the liquidity value. And then you have a bubble component to as well, potentially. Okay, that's another potential uh, thing kicking in. And actually, the higher this lambda is, the higher it's the possibility, the more possible it is uh, that there's a bubble term as well. So what does it mean to create scenery? Creating scenery essentially means uh, you, ho you have potentially assets which have very high Z's, but they have essentially uh, this capital lambda is one. So there's some assets which have high payoffs, and they have no you know, service flow, but they have high payoff and high cash flow. So they are high cash flow Z's assets, but low service flow in terms of relaxing the liquidity constraint. So this term is essentially zero. And there's some other assets who have low cash flows, low Z's, but they have a high service flow. I call this relaxing the liquidity constraint a service flow. So there's and what you do is, as a bank, for example, you hold on the asset side assets with high cash flows at low service flows, and then you issue liability assets which have a high service flow, but they don't have to have such high cash flow. And this difference you cash in, and that's your senior rich. Okay. So in the extreme case, you could actually have no assets at all if you have the power and credibility uh, you can actually issue just some bubbly assets. Okay, So you don't have to have any assets, you just issue this bubble and that's you just cash in this bubble. And that's what you know with Libra or with Facebook, you just can issue some Libra currency and then you cash in and invest and hold this essentially much more profitable or enjoy uh, this free lunch. Okay. Now 
that there's essentially no social resource cost from creating this liquid liquid asset, this public asset, and that's more generally what what you can see and you can see that private banks are doing this too so the synergy in a broader sense the synergy rents go to the public sector and also the private sector to the extent that they hold some illiquid uh, assets with high cash flows and low service flows and they're issuing some highly liquid assets with low cash flow but high service flow instead and then the question is you know how big is the scenery for the private banking sector that depends to a large extent on the competition in the private banking sector. If there's a lot of competition in the private banking sector, then of course what will happen is that the interest rate, the return of this transaction will be squeezed and will be driven down. So the interest will actually go up on, on the, uh, will go down on the, the lending margins and the interest on the checking accounts will go up. Okay, and then the margins are shrinking. But you can view this difference between checking accounts and um, having the assets. You can view this as a form of synergy uh, as well. Of course, for the government, they can do it even more extremely. They, they typically offer some bubble asset and just issue this uh, money. And what happens if you now introduce CBDC? You introduce more public money. How does it crowd out? and compete with the private banking sector. And there's this argument that the private banking sector will be chalked off of investments that can't do some lending anymore. And that's essentially what we want to do, look at this next. Is there a way that you can keep this equivalent? Okay, can you keep the equivalence? And this equivalence um, is seen here in this little economy which I have depicted here. So there are some firms, they run some physical capital, they have some loans, and the, the loans are held as assets by the banking sector. The, the firms also issue equity. The equity is held by the household sector here. And the, the banks fund themselves primarily through deposits, also held by the household sector, and also some bank equity, which is, again, held by the household sector. At the end, everything is ultimately held by the household sector. The banks can also issue some, some bank debt which then you know, is held by the central bank together with the government. So I've consolidated the central bank and the government into one balance sheet. Okay, that's essentially some LTRO and all the special funding structures the central banks have towards the private banks. And the central bank is also issuing some money. And it's held by the households again. And the government is issuing some government bonds. Some of the government bonds is then bought by the central bank, but the large chunk is issued by the, is held by the households as well. So issued by the government, held by the households. In order to be 100% correct, we also have to say the government itself has some future ability to tax in future generations and also commitments to pay in future periods. And that's the present value of primary surpluses. Uh, the surpluses so is on the asset side. And to the extent that there's something left, there's some implicit government equity so the government is essentially owned by the citizens so all the households they also own uh, the government so that's also to some extent a claim uh, the households have on on the governments it's got, you can't legally enforce it but economically there's a claim there so and of course the, the taxes have to be paid by the households which then is a liability uh, for the households towards the government but ultimately, all of the wealth in the economy is held by uh, the households, here's the net worth of the households. Now the question is, if uh, the government were to introduce CBDC, will it crowd out deposits? Yes, it will crowd out deposits. So, this, so you see now the households hold fewer deposits because in this particular example, let's assume CBDC are perfect substitutes for deposits. Uh, then it will crowd out bank deposits. And now the bankers have only a larger funding from the deposit. So this part is now missing. But the central bank can step in and expand its funding by the same amount. So if it raises some funds through the issuance of CBDC, it can just pass it on. 
and then there are certain conditions where you can just pass it on at the right interest rate, then actually the whole introduction of the CBDC will be neutral. It will be equivalent. It will not change anything in the macro economy. So it can be done introducing CBDC such that investment is not chalked off at all. So there's no change in the actual thing. So the central bank is just passing through the funding. Uh, and nevertheless, we have uh, more CBDC in the economy, more of this outside money. And this way, it's easy to fend off uh, the attacks to monetary sovereignty uh, for the central bank. So, of course, there are many alternatives. The banks are non-competitive. One has to be careful how to pass on the funding to make sure that there will be no distortion of this, but it can be done. Uh, and the paper outlines exactly how to do it. If the banks are perfectly competitive, then this is even easier because the banks have zero profits to make on the new funding will not change the zero profit conditions. Okay, but you pause on the funding. So finally, I would like to close with the final thoughts on the international monetary system and digital currency areas. Okay, we talked about currency competition, which is already also part of you know the international component, but more generally what happens if we have uh, digital currencies. So that re re raises the question, which uh, side passed so far, what is actually a separate currency? And in this paper with Harold James and Jean-Pierre Landau, we say a separate currency is if it's a, a currency has a unit of account, if something has a different unit of account, it's a separate currency. And it, it has to be converted, everything is 100% convertible to this uh, unit of account that's part of the currency. Okay, same unit of account and convertibility. And then, of course, what's the difference between convertibility? Convertibility means I can just swap one for the next. And you know, if I have a bank account, it maintains uh, the value. It's always in euros, my bank account. And because of deposit insurance, uh, there's uniformity in this money. That's often referred to as uniformity of money or singleness. So I don't have to worry my bank account is some different euro than the euro uh, I get in my bank note or some coin. Okay. So there's, and of course, if a bank becomes insolvent and then there's a risk that actually I might not get my bank account money, then you might think, oh, the bank account is not, is almost a different currency because it's not one to one uh, backed anymore. So convertibility is different from backing. So you can also back it, but backing means it's at the mercy of this entity saying, I back my currency to the euro. But if they say oh, tomorrow we changed our mind, we stopped our backing. So you can have a currency board like the Hong Kong dollar is back to the US dollar, but it can be changed. So then we would regard this as not the same currency. Of course, the Hong Kong currency, it doesn't have the same unit of account. There's a fixed exchange rate, fairly fixed exchange rate, but it is uh, not one for one. Similarly, for stable coins, they're just backed. So there's no guarantee behind There's no legally, you can't legally enforce it. So there are separate currencies in our definition. Okay. So that's this issue convertibility is very important to understand what's a separate currency. Of course, there are also differences in terms whether currency is account-based or token-based. And as I mentioned earlier, a token-based is like a coin. I pass on the coin and the, the finality of the payment happens. So it's all done. Uh, if it's account-based, uh, I can, you know, some the banks involved in these transactions have to approve the payment. They have to verify the account owners or have money laundering issues and all this in account-based system is different to be handled compared to a token based where there's no intervention, no 30 party approving the payment or not. Okay. If you go to digital money, it's not as clean a distinction between token and account based it is between coins and a bank deposit transfer because coins are really clean tokens, a pass on the token, everything is done, nobody has to approve. Of course, if you have a cryptocurrency, there will be some miners who have to mine this transaction at the end. So even though it's often referred to as token based, it has a little bit of account based features as well. Now, in terms of the international monetary system, if you have digital currency areas, 
So a digital currency area we define as you have your own unit of account and you have only a payment instrument inside. Okay, so if you have your own unit of account, then it is a different currency area. And it can be in a digital space. No, it doesn't need to be a geographical space. And if you can only trade it within, if there are huge exit costs, then it's also a digital currency area. So both one of the two, and then you have a digital currency area. Okay, and then uh, it's often connected with the digital platform and it's not necessarily connected with geographic, geographic boundaries. So the boundaries are digital boundaries. Okay, and they are not the boundaries between the uh, particular countries. And uh, that's, that's a new thing. It's a different area. It's in a, an area in a digital space. And of course, once you're on the digital platforms, you get price discounts. There's a different form of price discovery. There's transparency within the platform, but not outside of the platform. And all of these things make a big difference. Once that's what we consider as a digital currency area, and then you can see there was overlaps with other areas, but and there's often a separate digital currency area. And then you have digital synthetic world currencies. Mark Carney was talking about it in last year's Jackson Hole's uh, presentation, where he talked about, you know, we can use these new technologies potentially to create a digital synthetic world currency. And I've proposed something uh, as well, where we said along what the ESPs, which Emmanuel mentioned, mentioned in, in his introductory remarks, uh, you can do the same thing at a global scale. So the big problem essentially is that we have safe assets. It's not the shortage of safe assets, which is a problem, especially after the COVID crisis. There will be a lot of these uh, government bonds floating around. The problem is much more the safe asset is not supplied symmetrically. Okay, so whenever the, there's a risk off, risk on shift, so risk from risk on to risk off, and everybody wants to get out of the risky assets and everybody wants to rush into the safe assets, then it will be the case that they're all rushing in the US treasuries, in the German bonds, and the Japanese government papers and so forth. And then there will be huge international capital flows and that destabilize the system. So while you know Germany and the US can do a huge fiscal expansion, stabilize their economy, uh, you know, the emerging economies cannot do that because the money is flowing out from them. And the question is, how do you stabilize a system where, in order to switch off this cap, international capital flight to safety flows? And that's what we're proposing here uh, with uh, student uh, Nick Huang, uh, where we're saying, okay, what, you, what I proposed for Europe, the ESPs, you can do for emerging economies as well, and we call it GLOSPs. And, and, and the key and the key insight essentially is to switch off these international capital flows. So let me sum up. I think the big innovation are digital platforms together with artificial intelligence, deep learning algorithms, which really give us way better recommender systems and this movement to a digital world. Smartphones played a role in the initial phase two tokens play a role, but it will lead to an inversion of the industrialization of financial activity. There will be a way more payment centric, way more uh, focus on platforms rather than a bank centric world. And this has implications and we have to understand this implication, how it will shift uh, money. And once you have platforms, platforms ha are different animals because the platforms, they're have an I.O. perspective, they control certain elements which we in the regular monetary economics or monetary policy, we take as environments as given. We don't impose exit costs, for example. So this not from competition will be a new form of competition. There will be an unbundling of the three roles of classical roles of money, and that will enhance competition. But there will be a rebundling with other features which will reduce competition. And if we don't impose interoperability on convertibility, like, you know, force on stable coins, uh, then there will be reduced competition. If we don't in enforce convertibility, the unit of account might be lost, and then you lose essentially monetary sovereignty, okay? And the monetary sovereignty, the most important element is the ability to manage the macroeconomy, to stabilize it, or to, 
um, to slow it down. So controlling not only uh, price stability, but also financial stability. And that's an important role um, plays here CBDC and the lender of last resort. CBDC, if the cash is going out, you want to replace it with something in a digital space. If all moves, everything moves in digital space, you want to replace with something which in digital space. Whether you want to do it directly through um, retail CBDC or much more indirectly where these platforms can offer tokens and the tokens then have to be one-to-one -one backed with wholesale CBDC or some form of digital reserves. Uh, that's you know it's, it's an open issue and it's probably the latter is probably the the more convenient way to go. Finally, I mentioned the implications for the monetary system. There will be digital currency areas, and the features which we know from the optimal currency area literature will still be there. But there will be new features which are specific to digital currencies. And I want to leave with a thought. You know when. Napster was coming out. Napster didn't survive uh, in the long run, but it really changed the whole music industry, and it's a different industry than it is it was before. And the question is whether Bitcoin and Libra will survive. That's, but I think it's probably a less interesting question. The more interesting question is it might be a catalyst for a big radical change, uh, and then we will have a world differently. And a lot of these monetary theorists, which we have, theories we have, uh, are now much more interesting in the light of these new developments. And a lot of the insights we know and have known are still very relevant uh, for that. So that's with this. I would like to thank you again for giving this opportunity. Uh, thanks, Emmanuel. Thank you very much again, Marcus, for this uh, stimulating keynote. This was a very well-tuned concluding session, which uh, has nicely picked up uh, many of the issues that we discussed over the last day and a half. It is my role now to conclude this conference. And instead of summarizing the entire event, let me just offer a few high-level observations um, from my personal point of view. Uh, we have seen that uh, payment systems and the externalities and complementarities they entail should clearly be getting more attention in academic work, in macro, finance, and in banking and to some extent uh, they are already. The rapid technological progress is confronting uh, us academics, but maybe even more so the policymakers with questions that we did not even see coming a few years ago. And this implies quite some pressure to act swiftly. As President Lagarde put it yesterday, central bankers should be agents of change in this process and cannot simply be bystanders. Uh, but in a sense, payment systems are the, the hardware underlying our economies, so the stakes are high and we cannot afford to act too hastily uh, and possibly make big mistakes. So th therefore, the research community needs to inform this ongoing policy debate with hands-on theoretical empirical analyses. Now, the papers we've seen yesterday and today uh, are all great examples of these efforts, but we, of course, need more of this and we also need it relatively quickly. So I hope that all of you uh, contribute to this effort and uh, I hope that you enjoyed the conference despite the missing social interactions. Um, now, when you're attending a conference, uh, it is difficult to see the amount of work behind the scenes. And I'm sure you'll believe me that uh, this is even more true for a virtual event. Let me therefore, on behalf of all of you, extend a hearty thank you to all the people in the background who have made this conference a smooth enterprise. Katik, Anand and Tim Berg did a great job uh, selecting the papers and discussants. Christine Thaler, Kira Dressler, Stephanie Koy, Corinna Wagner, Katja Freter, Philipp Müller, uh, Thorsten Borbe, Magnus Makele, Alexander Arzt and the team of West NTV combined did an amazing job organizing the event and managing the technical infrastructure. Uh, with just a small exception of the sound quality at the very end of the conference, to which I apologize. And of course, I would like to thank all of you, uh, the speakers, discussants, the session chairs, and the audience for their contributions and your participation. We would have now offered drinks, uh, possibly some sightseeing tour in Berlin. Uh, this we have to postpone to some other event uh, or time. So instead, let me thank you again, and please uh, stay safe in these challenging times. Bye-bye.